So good day and uh, welcome everybody uh, to this in latest in our series of free facilitation webinars. Uh, my name is Martin Gilbraith. Um, I'm located in London in the UK. I'm delighted to be joined today by Sonny Walker again, who's co-hosted several of these webinars with me, and today also by Jim Campbell, who is here today, facilitating authentic participation. All right, I just unmuted everybody, and I think, Sekai, it's your uh, microphone that is um, giving us some issues. Uh, it looks like we've lost it. Thank you, Sunny, for taking care of that. Would you like to just say a few words about yourself? Sure. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I have no idea what you said earlier, but I'm uh, based in the near the Rocky Mountains in Denver, Colorado, and we actually have sun today. We've been having oh, climate change, rain and hail. <laughs> Not nearly the storms Dallas has had, but um, yeah, I'm a facilitator and trainer in the top and ICA tradition, and have been for as you can tell by my lovely gray. <laughs> For quite some time. And thank you for joining me again, Sonny, I'm and really supporting me of the in the facilitation and especially the technology here today. And Jim, tell us a little about yourself <laughs> for those pleasure. who don't know you. Well, uh, I'm uh, like Sonny, I'm a facilitator and a trainer in the ICA top tradition. I lived and worked in the, la the last time I, I lived and worked, I worked in, I was in Brussels, Belgium for 32 years. I facilitated across Europe, the Middle East and Africa. And I taught at a college in Dublin, Ireland, where we taught facilitation courses there. Uh, I left there at the end of October, 2013, and I now live in a suburb of Medellin, Colombia. And uh, so I've been here a little, oh, about five and a half years. And um, Medellin is the city of the eternal spring. And uh, I am still enjoying the eternal spring. <laughs> yeah, that's... that's uh... Thank you. Um, we will... Uh, take a sure. look at your introductions in the chat pods. While we do that, let me invite all of you also to use the emoticon um, next to the raised hand symbol at the top of your screen. And please uh, click on the down arrow to the right of that and, and indicate agree if you have bought the book or even read the book. And that will give us an indication of just how much knowledge there already is among you of the of the contents of the book. Um, while you're doing that, I can see there are several ICA top colleagues here, several very familiar to us. Um, several of you I know through the uh, IAF England and Wales network and otherwise through IAF. Um, interestingly, I can see that most of you do not regard yourselves as professional facilitators, but most of you use facilitation in your work. 
and we have uh, more in North America than uh, Europe this time, which is also interesting. Um, let's see how many have read the book. Two or three have read the book and also know how to say so. Well, several have worked out how to say that they don't, so that's also helpful. Mm. Um, so that's good. There's there's lots still for people to learn then, Jim. And we're seeing interests and expectations here in the okay. chat. Um, enjoying connecting people with each other, enjoying the book, looking forward to listening, expecting to learn more tips. The book's on my to-read list. Very good. Any other reflections on who's here before we move forward? I realize I haven't uh, run through the agenda of the meeting. Those of you who have uh, attended one of these before will be familiar with the with the format. Uh, we're just coming to the end of the opening, the overview, and the introductions. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to move to the next screen. We'll give Jim about 20 minutes uh, to share some of the insights from the book um, and show us some slides as he does as he does so. And then we'll take some questions and answers. Um, so please feel free to share questions in the pod uh, as Jim talks, and then we'll take some of your questions verbally afterwards. Um, and then in the discussion, we'll be putting some questions to you and asking you to share something of your experience of some of the issues raised um, by the book um, and any uh, insights or next steps that you'll be taking away before we before we share some feedback and close at the end of the hour. Um, so if you're ready, shall we move on to the presentation? So please do share questions and comments in the chat pod to the right, which is now extended a little for ease of use. Um, and remember, if you do struggle to see these slides in the chat in the display pod in the center, you can use the full screen control by hovering your cursor over the right top right of that uh, pod. So over to you, Jim. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Maybe a little bit of background. This book is based on the advanced course of facilitation that I taught at Al Hallows College in Dublin, Ireland. That course evolved. Uh, I first began teaching it in the late 1990s in Brussels. At that time, it was a 15-day course. I divided into five modules. And uh, eventually, the course uh, at Al Hallows became a 10-day course with two modules of two days each and two modules of three days each. That course was offered both to a degree program, since it was accredited uh, by the City University of Dublin, and also in their continuing education program. The book is divided into two major sections. Uh, the, the first section I entitled The Inclusive Responsibility of the Facilitator. It's about uh, the age of participation and the times we're living in, uh, the nature of participation and the role of a facilitator in all of this, the, what I call the philosophy of facilitation. Not sure that's a good word, but that's what I call it. Then the rest of the book, the second section is walking through in some detail the steps and phases of the facilitation cycle. I'm going to share some of the highlights uh, and try and go through these uh, quickly and leave time, lots of time for questions. Uh, so I'm not going to be telling many stories or going into any great detail, but sort of trying to uh, just, just hit the highlights. Um, so, uh, and I understand that Martin afterwards will be sending everybody a copy of these slides and access to a copy of the presentation, etc. So you'll be able to get these. This first slide uh, is about uh, one of the key features, one of the key features out of the first section of the book about participation and how one way to look at human history is to look at it through as a journey to greater and greater participation. And uh, in the first module of the course, I traced uh, this journey uh, using this uh, kind of analysis. Um, 
Okay. Uh, you, you can go all the way back and begin with Plato's Republic. I don't think it was, I don't think it's an accident that one of the first philosophers in, in our history, uh, ideal, uh, created an, uh, a picture of a participatory form of government as an ideal. Uh, the Roman Republic was the form of government that involved participation and was really what Rome's greatness was built on uh, before it descended into uh, uh, an empire and all of that. The Magna Carta in 1215 in, the, in England was another turning point uh, in the Middle Ages where the powers of a absolute monarch were limited and power was evolved to uh, the nobility, the landed people. Uh, a key shift was the Renaissance and the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. What was important here was the focus upon this, the human, the focus upon this world rather than the divine realm, and the significance of understanding that man is made in the image of God and that every man has a unique relationship to God. Uh, this established the idea that every human being is equal and uh, of value, of equal value. This was picked up and transformed in the age of reason or the age of enlightenment um, in, the, in the 18th century, where the philosophers of the time struggled with the question of sovereignty. Where does sovereignty reside in a society? And their final answer to that question was it resides in the people. And the American and French revolutions invented liberal democracy and launched us on the journey of uh, creating forms of governance that are based on the sovereignty of the people rather than the sovereignty of the ruling class. The 19th century uh, really saw the working out of who uh, could participate in this uh, in this governance. Uh, it began originally with the male landed classes of people, uh, and throughout the 19th century it was expanded and expanded. Uh, but it was only in the early part of the 20th century that uh, the franchise was extended to women, and it was not until the 1970s that the age limit was lowered from 21 to 18 in most parts of the world. But it has been continued to be expanded. Um, I lived in Brussels uh, for 32 years. And in Belgium, if you live in the a local municipal area for five years, then no matter what your nationality, you can participate in the local elections for that municipality. And so I was eligible to vote in the local elections in uh, my in my municipal area while I lived in Belgium. So we the journey of expanding participation has continued. But the important thing that happened in the 20th century was that we began to understand that this business of participation was not just a political right, that it was a human right. And this was um, documented or incorporated into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was created after the Second World War by the United Nations. And we understand today that when you limit people's participation, you're limiting their humanness. You literally are denying them the full, uh, their full capacity as a, as a human being. And so today, the question of participation is much more than just um, political right or uh, it is a human right. And uh, we've seen that, uh, we see that, we've seen that, and we continue to see that being acted on and acted out around the world. And a lot of what's happening in the world today fundamentally has to do with people saying, I want to take responsibility for my destiny. I want to participate in creating my destiny and my future. Anyway, the, uh, yeah. So I think the 21st century, there's a great book called The Age of Participation 
I think the 21st century is the going to be the age of participation. Then moving on to the facilitation cycle itself, the cycle is divided into four stages and seven phases. The first stage has to do with the getting started, the initial contact, the gaining entry, and contracting. Uh, both of these stages are extremely important and set the stage for the whole rest of the, of the relationship and the journey as a facilitator with a client. Uh, and uh, it's very important to get this right, uh, no matter how a client comes to you, uh, but to do this uh, to do this adequately. Contracting can be anything. Uh, a lot of my facilitation experience was with handshake contracts, but also particularly working with international organizations or corporations, having uh, full-blown legal documents, that kind of thing. Uh, however you do that, uh, one of the key things in contracting is details working out, making sure you cover all the details. The devil really is in the details. And things can go wrong and go wrong very unhelpfully later on in the process if you don't uh, make sure that uh, all of the details have been sorted out and understood uh, and who's responsible for what, etc. Uh, the second stage has to do with what I call needs assessment. Um, this is just looking at the situation that they're, that you're being invited to work in and what's really going on there. This very often gets, uh, I think, facilitated very often, just take the word of the people they're talking to. Uh, I learned the hard way that that's uh, not good uh, and very often can be misleading. And so I uh, became a person as a facilitator who insisted on reaching out beyond those people, the one or two people or the small committee that had initially contacted me and reaching out beyond um, them to talk with other people and that kind of thing. And um, I, find that extreme, I found that extremely important. And sometimes that required being getting pretty creative. Uh, one time I had to make a series of long distance phone calls across Europe to talk to the people who were coming to the meeting uh, in order to uh, feel that I'd really had a hold of the situation. Another thing that's important here is that in my experience very often, what people say their situation is or what people say their problem or the challenge in their situation is, is really symptomatic of a much deeper issue that because they are so deeply involved in it, they don't see it. And that uh, part of a facilitator's job is getting at those deeper issues because if those things are not transformed, then things are not really going to be changed uh, for the group or organization. The third stage is uh, the real preparation. This is where a facilitator's skill, knowledge, expertise comes into play. And I divide this phase, uh, this stage, uh, into two key parts. Uh, I call it the design and development. Uh, the design is the creating of the whole process. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're doing a two or three day event, uh, what is the overall plan for this process? Laying out that design. Uh, and then the development is drilling down into depth, step by step for each of the different uh, parts of the overall design. Uh, as I say in the book, I'm a person who writes a script and I, I share one of those scripts in the book I literally sit down and think about what I'm going to do in real time so that I write a script. It has stage directions. It has uh, all of the information I need to do that. Uh, I know other facilitators make some notes on a piece of paper and they're good to go. Uh, everybody has to do it their own way. But the important thing is to think through in depth what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And uh, whatever that means for you, that but to 
to do that kind of detailed work. Then I find that when I've done that, then when I've, when I need to flex, when I need to make adjustments, when I need to deviate from my plan, I'm deviating from a plan and I know where I'm going and I can deviate and still uh, reach the final objective with the group. Uh, so it, for me, that's, that, that's really, really important. Um, <clears throat> the last stage, uh, phases five and six and seven, uh, has to do with program delivery and this engagement. In terms of program delivery, uh, for me, a, a facilitator, when he's in front of the pro, front of a group, working with a group, he has three full-time tasks. One of those is to guide the group through the process. That's a full-time job when you're in front of a room. The second full-time job in front of the room is to guide and manage uh, the group dynamics so that um, so that if there's conflict or if there's uh, people are dominating the discussion or whatever it is, you are able to, if those group dynamics are hindering uh, the group from moving toward its objectives, you're able to deal with those. That's a full-time job. And the third full-time job for me is managing the information. The facilitator doesn't have input into the situation, but you do have to ensure that uh, all of the information is being, all of the relevant information is being shared. <coughs> Excuse me. That people's agendas are being gotten out, even the hidden agendas. Uh, and that uh, everybody understands that they have every opportunity to participate and speak their mind, etc. So those three full-time jobs uh, are what a facilitator has to be about when they're in front of the group. And <coughs> excuse me, that requires a, a, a high level of focus and. A, profound degree of concentration on the situation and it's the journey of the group through that situation. Disengagement, <coughs> just ensuring that everything is covered, that uh, there are no loose ends. Sometimes uh, that means, uh, uh, I, I say in my training, so very often as a facilitator, I feel like a fireman. Once the fire is out, uh, we say adios to each other and we're off and I never hear or see of them again. But I've had lots of clients where we've gone back to, they've said, okay, now we want you to work on this. And we've gone back to a new contract or we've even uh, in several situations, we haven't even done to the contracting level. We've just continue with the same contract and I've gone back to the data collection and analysis and that kind of thing. So disengagement can mean a number of things. Anyway, the book itself, <coughs> I'm sorry, the book itself has all of this laid out and laid out in considerable detail. Um, so um, that's the cycle. This is uh, <coughs> in the data collection and uh, analysis phase. One of the things I've discovered is that you never have a client. You have a client system. And that client system can be very, very complex. And this is an illustration of what I mean by that. This is a client I worked with, a client system I worked with a number of years ago. I was contacted by the international headquarters of a global relief agency, one of the biggest in the world. And they asked me to go and work with one of their country offices that was in the midst of a major refugee crisis. Now, the, in that situation, there was the current country director <coughs> who was responsible for this work. But he was leaving and going to join the staff of the international headquarters. And the new country director was coming in, and both of them were going to be in the meeting. 
This was happening because this international organization has three countries in the world that take responsibility for major refugee crises. And the country that was responsible for this particular crisis well, had been asked to assume responsibility for another crisis on the other side of the world. And so they had to withdraw from this situation in order to pick up that situation. And so the whole situation, the whole situation was being transferred to another one of these uh, countries that assumed this kind of responsibility. This was a huge uh, transition. Uh, they were they were providing support for over 600,000 refugees, uh, uh, food, housing, health, social services, everything. And uh, hundreds and hundreds of vehicles and computers and everything that belonged to the original country that had they had to figure out how to transfer all of this to the new incoming country. Uh, in addition, they had, <coughs> they had offices in a number of countries that did not assume responsibility for a crisis situation, but were there in order to raise funds from the governments of those countries. And so this, this particular situation was receiving funds from Austria, France, and the United Kingdom. So they were very invested in ensuring that this uh, whole transition worked. These refugee crises are dealt with by UNHCR, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, but they are not an operational organization. <coughs> they contract these international relief organizations to do the, to do this work. So they too were invested in this. So all of this, all of these people were in the meeting. There were representatives of the international organization. All of the heads of the different divisions in the country office were there. Uh, security, communications, operations, uh, transport, transportation, etc. Both country, the old and new country directors were there. Uh, both of the operating countries sent uh, staff to be part of it. The three funding countries sent staff to be part of it, and the UNHCR had a couple people there. So they were all in the room. They all had their concerns, their agendas. They were all involved in uh, not only how this transition was going to be managed, but how the uh, support work that they were that they were doing would be continued and sustained uh, without any hiccups. So I didn't have a client. It wasn't the woman from the international office that called me uh, to ask me to do this. This this was the client system, uh, and uh, all of that had to be dealt with. Uh, not every client system is um, <clears throat> so complex. I, there are many ways you can identify the real client in a situation, but I find asking three simple questions <coughs> is uh, really helpful. One of them is, who knows? Who has the information uh, about the situation? Uh, and the second one is, who cares? Uh, who has some sort of investment in the situation? Who cares? And the third one is who can? Who can do things? Who controls the finances? Who controls human resources? I facilitated sessions where uh, the group was told, you cannot deal with human resources, you cannot deal with finances, but everything else was on the table. That's fine. Once once you know that, then uh, you can work with that. But uh, so identifying who knows, who cares, and who can uh, is uh, something that I, is sort of a screen that I use to think about the client and who really is the client. This is an image I used, I used in my training, what we do as facilitators, that <clears throat> in a situation you have the existing situation and you have the desired situation. And there's a gap in the middle uh, where there's a need. And the job of facilitator is to bridge that gap, is to journey a group from their existing situation to the desired future situation. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 
So in a sense, uh, being a facilitator is uh, being a bridge builder with a group. And I'm finally, uh, this is another image or a framework for program design and development. Uh, you start with uh, where people are, what is the existing situation. Uh, this is uh, stages. Uh, one and two with the needs assessment and all of that, then uh, you're going to go on a journey um, where people want to get to their future desired situation. Uh, this is where you identify <coughs> the objectives for the meeting. I find it's very important for me to think through carefully and agree with the client on, on how those objectives transfer translate into outputs and uh, products. What kinds of outputs, what kinds of products are you going to have? Uh, just uh, stopping with objectives is not enough. And then, of course, the, the task is to, in program design and development, is to design the journey, um, how they're going to get from where they are to where they want to go. And that is uh, sometimes that involves taking something off the shelf like top participatory strategic planning. But even then, you very often have to tweak and make adjustments to, um, to the process. But very often, you have to create an entirely unique process. And I illustrate some of that in the book uh, and share one share one, <coughs> excuse me, one unique process that, uh, that I designed a number of years ago for a group. Uh, <clears throat> okay, that's the presentation. So I'll turn it back to Martin and Sonny and we'll uh, answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. That's fascinating. Um, I do invite those who are attending um, to raise their hand if they have a question, if they have a microphone rights and they would like to uh, speak their question. Otherwise, please type a question in the chat pod to the right um, and we'll draw your questions from there. Jim, I wonder if you'd like to go get yourself a glass of water before we put questions to you. <laughs> are you all right? Yes, I would. Thank you. Right. You, do, you yeah, do that. Right. You do that. Um, while you do that, let me just say um, one of the things I've most appreciated about Jim's book is firstly the, the first section he described, the age of participation, uh, which really helps to put the role of the facilitator and the facilitation cycle into the largest possible context, um, which I find very valuable and, uh, and in my experience is not often addressed uh, in books and training on facilitation. Um, and equally, what I find also uh, very rarely addressed in facilitation training and literature is the, the broader facilitation cycle. Uh, much of it, in my experience, is about um, tools and methods, or if you're lucky, how to adapt and apply them into a design. Um, if you're really lucky, maybe what you can do when things go wrong, which is what my last uh, presenter in the previous webinar last month or two months ago, Rebecca Southerns, was addressing. But to see the whole cycle here from first contact with the client right through to the uh, delivery of the program and uh, evaluation disengagement is very helpful. Because a facilitator really needs to know this stuff, just like a, a consultant. Uh, so please do share your questions and comments. Anybody like to raise their hand? Thank you, Larry, by the way, for sharing some uh, highlights in the general chat as well. There's some reminders there of what we went through. Any questions, any reflections? Please yeah, go ahead. Or Sunny, do you have back. any? Oh, Yulia has raised her hand. Uh, yes, I was Yulia, just going to go comment ahead. that. Go ahead. <laughs> Yulia, please go ahead. We'll come back to Sunny. Oh, you don't have a microphone yet. I'm just enabling your microphone, Yulia. And you'll need to connect 
the mic by clicking on the mic button at the top of the screen. Nancy has raised her hand as well. Let me come to Nancy first, because I know, Nancy, your mic is already connected. And then we'll come back to Yulia and then to Patricia Nunes. Nancy? No, I'm not hearing she you, Nancy. Typed her um, into the your microphone. Oh, hey. Yeah. Her, her question is, uh, Jim, yeah. in phase four, diagnose the problem. She says, help me understand the type of problems you might diagnose, if you could provide an example. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, it, it has to do, in, in the top processes, uh, key, to, key to doing them is what's called the focus question. That is, uh, what you focus the workshop, what you focus the strategic planning on, that kind of thing. Uh, I worked with an international organization, um, and I did, uh, I worked with the administration, administrative division that was divided, uh, had had eight different departments in the administration, and I did a strategic planning with all eight of those departments. And the challenge there was they were all very clear about what their mission was, what their task was, what they had to do. But the challenge was they, uh, their internal operations, the administration. Uh, and so each one of them had unique challenges. And some that had to do with the, <coughs> with, uh, <coughs> How the uh, how the department was how the division was structured. Others it had to do with human relationships, and so <clears throat> in talking and working with each one of those departments, we had to identify what were the unique uh, challenges in the department that we needed to focus the planning on if the department was going to move forward more effectively. Uh, yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thanks, Jim. Uh, we have questions from Yulia, Patricia Nunes, Richard, and then Catherine. Let's see if Yulia has uh, enabled her microphone. Uh, yes, Yulia, hello. Would you like to go ahead? Can you hear me now? Oh, great. Yes, thank you. Um, so first of yes. all, thank you very much for this webinar. It was really interesting and maybe one really Stupid question from my side. What is the difference between products and outputs on the previous slide? Good question. Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, I suppose in a, in a sense, I'm trying to go to the slide, but I can't seem to get it to work. Here we go. Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. That one, next one, yeah. Next one, there we go. Yeah, there we are. Uh, I suppose uh, most of the time they're the same thing. Uh, there's not really any different. Uh, uh, when I like, I've done strategic planning with an organization, and <coughs> they wanted me to not only produce a document that had the entire strategic plan in it, but they wanted to, for example, the implementation uh, timeline. They wanted me to design a uh, a graphic timeline kind of thing with. Uh, tasks and names on it and that kind of thing that they could distribute to everybody and that they can make large copies of to put up in their office. And so I think it's a, they're essentially the same thing. Uh, I don't really make a distinction there. But for me, it's important to translate those objectives into what, you know, what do people have in their hands, uh, in their hand whenever they leave. Yeah. Thank you. And Patricia Nunes. 
Would you like to go ahead and speak? Or you've, you've typed a question in the pod. What's the thread that connects the philosophy of pl facilitation from Plato and what's evolved to the current times? Briefly, if possible. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think the thread that connects it is just simply the, throughout history, uh, greater and greater participation. It's the devolution of uh, responsibility and, and sovereignty from the those who were anointed by God or who were in, who uh, initially in ancient in ancient history, pre-Christian history, at least in the West. Uh, <coughs> Rulers, when they ascended the throne, became divine. Uh, the Japanese emperor lost his divine status in 1945. <coughs> in the West, once the Christian era began, a uh, king could not be divine, but they were anointed by God and the divine right of kings. And from Plato's day, where it was... Uh, the ruling male elite, the male elite who participated to the image today that uh, sovereignty resides in the governed. Uh, and that throughout history, that the gradual devolution of uh, sovereignty to a greater and greater uh, degree to, to all the people. Uh, and that's not been a straightforward kind of devolution. It's <coughs> there have been lots of setbacks. How, how do you see and, the relationship uh, between the gradual uh, increase of participation through the ages and the series of revolutions that uh, we've experienced? The um, agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution. Uh, Communications revolution, etc. Yeah, all of those were had a participatory dimension to it. Uh, the The political revolution was uh, the 18th century. Uh, the 19th century saw the invention of economics and the emergence of the idea that people had the right to participate in the econo in the economic well being of their community and securing the economic well being of their of their family, uh, and today, of course, uh, we live in a uh, people. Uh, people expect to have uh, uh, a say about what's going to happen in the organizations and the companies and corporations and places where they're working. Uh, people resist being simply dictated to. It used to be that you know what responsibility men in a corporation was. You did what you were told. Today, that's no longer adequate. And uh, the best and brightest and all the rest of us um, are resisting that. Thank and you. so, and then of course, in the, in the 20th century was the cultural revolution and that we're still working through. Mm -hmm. But the whole, uh, the whole question of uh, authority and who has authority? Um, right. There's a great book uh, published in the UK entitled uh, "Why Should Anyone Want to Be Led by You?" And uh, <laughs> their their point is that today we look for authenticity in a leader, not for somebody who's occupying a position, and we automatically give him uh, the authority that goes with that position. We look for authenticity. And um, so all of that, for me, okay. it, it has to do as part of the journey of participation. Thank you. Let's take the last two questions just very, very quickly, if we may, Jim, so that we can put some questions to our participants. Richard, are you uh, ready? Do you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Please, please go ahead. Confirm. Excellent. Yes, thanks. Uh, first of all, Martin, yes. thank you for putting these webinars together. And thanks, Jim, for your presentation. I, Jim, I was intrigued by your choice of words. It is facilitating authentic participation. So could you speak a little bit to your choice of words and what it signifies? 
Yeah. Uh, 